Welcome everybody who's joining us. Oh, hi Jackie, you made it. <laughs> Personal shout out across the universe. <laughs> Australia. Welcome to everybody as we give this a moment for everyone to join. Um, so happy you're all with us today. Uh, we are opening closed captioning. We will be, we are live streaming currently on Facebook. Welcome to everybody who is joining us today. I'm Emily Zayden. I'm the director of the Craft in America Center here in Los Angeles. And we are thrilled to have Mira Nakashima with us today across the country in New Hope, Pennsylvania. Just a couple quick words as people um, join the Zoom. We uh, have a, our exhibition up currently of Craft in America's permanent collection. We have a small burgeoning collection of objects made by um, artists who we've featured in the Craft in America PBS episodes over the years and um, other artists who we've featured in exhibitions as well. And that prompted the talk today with Mira. We have an incredible table that's been a fixture in the center for many, many years. And so pleased to have, have that with us. For anyone who's not uh, able to join us today, if you care to spread the word, we will have a recording up of this program eventually next by next week up on our YouTube channel, on the Craft in America website. Um, and the recording will be on Facebook as well, of course, so people can reference it in the future. Um, I also encourage everyone to post questions in the Q&A and chat for Mira to address after she finishes her slides. So with that, just want to thank you again, Mira. You are um, an anchor of the furniture, studio furniture movement uh, for decades, generations now, what uh, Nakashima Woodworkers signifies. So it's really an honor and pleasure to have you today. You were featured in the first, uh, one of the first episodes of the Craft in America series, and it's the anniversary of that this month, May, those aired in 2007. So um, special moment to share with you and being here today. So thank you again, and I will let you take it away. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank you, Emily, and thank, uh, thank you, Carol, for uh, meeting me in Los Angeles uh, in March on very short notice. It was lovely to see you and to thank you for all you've done for the craft uh, movement. And uh, thank you for inviting me to participate today. I think before we be begin uh, the talk, um, I would like just to, if everybody could sort of take a deep breath and think about the peace that you feel when you go into a woods. Nowadays, they call it, what do they call it, forest? bathing or something. But dad did this way back in the beginning of the, the 20th century. And I want to read a few quotes from his book, The Soul of a Tree, which has inspired many woodworkers uh, since he wrote it in 1981 and is still being reprinted uh, by Kodansha. And uh, we're all grateful to him. It's become our Bible when, when we're, you know, we, we sometimes get to a point and wonder what to do next. And then we think, what would George do? And then we pull out the soul of a tree and figure out what to do next. So I just wanted to share uh, some quotes with you. Um, he says in his first chapter, as a boy, I enjoyed roaming the mountains of the Pacific Northwest. Higher and higher I climbed, passing the great Douglas firs, which punctured the heavens. Exploring along the way, I would follow the riverbeds or the railway tracks until the trees ended at the timber line. And then when he got up there, he said, it's a lonely land with long vistas, just this side of Samadhi, the eternal trance. There's an awesome feeling in the immensity, the absolute serenity of these rude lands of passionless silence. No birds sing. A bald eagle glides noiselessly in the thin air above. Occasionally, the wail of a coyote far below can be heard. 
These solitary trips had a profound meaning for me. I had a sense of viewing creativity as its source. These trips dramatized for me the joy of living simply, close to nature, of fishing in small lakes nestled like jewels in the crease of a mountain, lakes probably never fished before, lakes where even the world's worst fishermen could make a catch. I don't know if that's true anymore, but it was back then. <laughs> And then um, he said, during the long hikes down, I never failed to be struck by nature's many moods. The harsh reality of stunted trees at the timberline hanging by threads of roots to small crevices and the moss hanging from deep from the tops of trees in the rainforest of the Ho Valley where only the slenderest shafts of light reached the ground. Finally, the great cathedral of magnificent trees, straight and taut, fully 10 feet in diameter, these were my personal relationships, ones that I would cherish through the years. And that I think is why my father went into forestry at the University of Washington before he switched to architecture. And now he's, he's gone. Um, this picture on the screen um, is a picture of um, my father's adventure to the island of Yaku off the island of Japan, where there were like 10,000 year old trees still living. And he was just, he'd heard about these trees and he was one of the oldest men to hike to the top of that mountain and actually see the trees. And here he is, um, I think he was in his eighties. I think he was 80 something when he climbed that mountain and got to see this tree. So that's my first slide. Um, but maybe we'll just leave that up for a while while I, I read for a little bit. It's my belief that since the beginning of man's existence on earth, he's used his hands in order to survive, to build shelter from the elements, to clothe himself, to create objects, to kill animals, to eat or avoid being eaten, to plant, nurture, and harvest plants for food, and make receptacles to hold them. Only in recent centuries has man used machines to create things beyond what is necessary for survival, to create art for art's sake, rather than something created by hand out of necessity. Therein lies the paradox of modern day craft, which no longer has the meaning defined by Soetsu Yanagi when he defined the Minge move movement in the early 20th century, that it be born of tradition, of necessity, for a particular use and that it be accessible to those who need it. Craft has become muddled by the ego expression of Western 20th century thinking to become something neither art artistic nor craft. The original Minge was born from the Zen concept of no self, passed on for generations during a period when there was pride and honor in taking one's time to do as good a job as possible, to savor and enjoy the making of it as well as to enjoy sharing it with others for their enjoyment in using it. So much of this craft tradition has been lost in the last century with industrialization and machinery. The user is no longer aware of the maker nor the source of materials used in the object. Money is the only common denominator between the maker, designer, finished product, and end user. All semblance of natural materials and human relationships have disappeared into the impersonal world of commerce and profit. My father came to understand and protest this as he traveled through his life, from his days hiking amongst the trees of the Pacific Northwest to his studies in Paris, work in Tokyo with the architect Antonin Raymond, to India where he built a dormitory for the disciples of his teacher Sri Aurobindo and the mother. They taught him that life itself is a gift from the divine and that artists are but conduits for the divine to work and manifest itself on earth. Ego is a curse and an impediment, but beauty is a manifestation of the divine and should be honored as such. It's only through this devotion to the divine and sublimation of the ego that true craft and art can be manifested. And this is what he found lacking in the Western world. His woodworking became a way to fulfill his karma yoga, the yoga of doing. Maybe we should start with the slides, please. Oh, this is a photograph of my father 
I think in the 1980s with his parents. Um, they were both born and brought up in Japan. My father was a grandfather was a scholar. My mother served in the court of the Emperor Meiji and uh, they came to the USA around the turn of the century. My grandmother was actually a picture bride <laughs> and um, they were married and um, had four children. My father was the first of them and they were I think maybe they were a little puzzled, but they insisted that their, their children should have a good education and make sure that dad got a, uh, a degree from the University of Washington. Next, please. Oh, so um, after he graduated from university in 1930, um, he tried to earn a living during the height of the depression and uh, found that it was, he said, the most best thing to do because jobs were scarce would be to sell his car and to buy a steamship ticket around the world. So he did that. He went to Paris where he had been before, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, and uh, bummed around Paris for a while and then got on the boat again and ended up in Japan, the land of his ancestors. And by that time, his father said, I think it's time he got a real job. So this is a picture of his real job uh, with Antonin Raymond. Uh, in the architect's office in Tokyo in 1934. That's in the center of the back row. Um, Anton is, is uh, in the middle row and his wife Noemi is in the front row. On her, would be her right, it's, it's the, on the picture that's the left is Kunio Mayakawa. And on the right, in the right hand corner, as we're looking at it, it's Junzo Yoshimura. And they were two of my father's best friends when he worked in the Raymond office in Tokyo. They uh, brought Western technology to the Japanese architectural world in the 20th century. And Anton and Raymond probably built the most um, modern buildings of any modern architect. Next, please. This is a um, picture of the outside of Golconde, which is a project that, my, uh, that uh, Anton and Raymond got. It was uh, the first reinforced concrete building built in India in 19, from 1936 to the 40s. It was not completed until the 1940s, but they needed an architect on site. So my father volunteered and uh, discovered that, you know, because nobody had done reinforced concrete before, he, it was more than just being an architect on site. He had to be general manager. He had to um, order all the supplies from abroad and teach people how to do reinforced concrete because nobody had a clue what to do with it. And so it was his great adventure. It was also a, a spiritual adventure for my father. He became very involved in the uh, ashram philosophy, became a disciple of Sri Aurobindo in 1938 and thought he was going to stay there for the rest of his life. However, um, the, the war broke out and uh, he decided he would have to get back on that boat and go back to the USA by way of Japan. Next, please. So on the way back to the US, he happened to meet my mother. My mother was born and brought up in Seattle as well, was on her way back home from Australia. And uh, so they fell in love and became engaged and were married in Los Angeles in 1941. Dad went up to Seattle. Um, he had done a survey trip of architecture in the USA because he'd been abroad for seven years. And he decided after seeing a Frank Lloyd Wright building under construction that he didn't want to be an architect anymore. And that's when he decided to make furniture. So he started off in, in Seattle with his little shop and was teaching the young men of the community how to do woodworking in exchange for the use of the tools because he didn't have enough money to buy tools. And the people on the right are from a later sequence, but um, a later period in, in history. But these are the original Knoll designers for Knoll Studios in the, in the uh, mid 1940s when dad came back east. But there's another piece of the story in between. Next, please. This is on the left hand side is a man named Gentaro Hikogawa. He was a trained master carpenter from Japan. He was incarcerated with us during the war. I guess I skipped that, but <laughs> in 1942, we were all, we and 120 some thousand uh, 
Japanese Americans were incarcerated because of World War II and sent to desert places. And our desert place was Minidoka in Idaho. And uh, my mother was a basket case. I was a tiny baby and, and dad, you know, he was a good camper, so he was okay. Uh, but he teamed up with this Japanese carpenter and he was eternally grateful to him for sharing with him the, the methodology, the tools, the joinery, just the way the Japanese carpenters work with the materials um, during those days when we were in camp. They were, they were put together as a team to try to make our barracks more livable. And that's the little workshop that that had. And Gencharo is working on some uh, bitter brush, which grew in the desert. And a lot of the incarcerees would collect it and work on it just to maintain sanity. But dad used it in his furniture in the early days. And uh, when we were released from camp, he must have brought a, a pile of it home because he used it in his early furniture when he, that he built in Pennsylvania. Next, please. Oh, this is after he established himself. We were uh, sponsored, thankfully, uh, by the Mr. and Mrs. Raymond who had left Japan, came back uh, to the US uh, that they couldn't come directly from Japan because of the war situation. So they went through South America, through Europe, and eventually came back to Pennsylvania and bought a, a farmhouse in New Hope, Pennsylvania. And my father's professor from MIT contacted the, the Raymonds and said, would you please sponsor the Nakashimas? Because he found uh, out that we were uh, incarcerated. And so the Raymonds sponsored us to come to Raymond Farm. Um, where dad was only allowed to do chicken farming. And then when the war was over, um, he rented a little cottage uh, right down the road from where we are now. And this is a scene from outside the, the old shop on Aquitong Road on the left. Uh, the War Relocation Authority took care of us around 1945, saying that the incarceration really didn't do us any harm at all. We were doing fine. And uh, so my mother dressed me up in my best dress and with a hammer and nail. So <laughs> that's how I got started in woodworking. Um, and this is the picture on the right is a later picture of dad's uh, steam bending process. He had one of his early projects was to create a chair for Rene Donacor, who was the head of MoMA at the time. And uh, dad thought he should make him a special chair. And he really didn't know how to bend backs in the beginning, but he learned. And this is his primitive back bender. Uh, we have a much more complicated and accurate backbender. Now we've learned over the years that it's, it's not easy, but there are better ways to do it than the old way. So this is a picture of the old way. Next, please. Um, Dad continued his love of trees in his entire life. Um, the picture on the left is a picture from probably around 1980 taken by a local photographer. Um, him just leaning on a tree. And I think it's this photograph in um, on the anniversary of my father's passing. I think it was the year 2000. Um, I was asked to help design a guitar for Martin Guitar because we used to go haul our lumber up there. And uh, so I helped design a guitar. I thought I'd never had a chance otherwise. And uh, they took a copy of this photograph and pasted it inside each of those 100 special guitars. So that's dad just leaning on a tree. <laughs> and the picture on the right is uh, from 1960 or so in the Conoid studio of him leaning on a plank from a tree. Next, please. And this is a picture from the 1970s as well of uh, me working in the shop and my brother and my father supervising. <laughs> These are some of the earliest tables that my father made. The one on the lower right is called a milk house table because my father built it in the Raymond Farm milk house, which was given to him as a, a little shop. And the planks were made of teak, um, which he brought. I, he might have brought them all the way from India. And we had them in Seattle when we were incarcerated. Dad's best friend, Morris Graves, saved uh, the planks for him and uh, returned them all to us when we came east and dad made that table in the milk house on Raymond Farm. So it's called a milk house 
The one on the left we named uh, Keisho. No, we called it Shoki because I found a packet of old drawings that my father had done in 1941. And this is one of the designs that he had created at that time. Next, please. This is before he got into the free form stuff that he got into later. Um, the chair on the left uh, is the grass seated chair, which my father learned how to bend the backs for, for René Darnoncourt in the 1940s. The chair on the right is called the straight back chair, which he uh, designed for Knoll Studios in the mid 40s. And uh, then uh, we made them at, at the studio as well. And just recently, the Knoll Studios has put them back into production. So that's a historic Nakashima design. Next, please. These are the mirror chairs, low, medium, and high. Um, they were designed for me, obviously. They're named Mira. And uh, there was an article in Look Magazine around 1951 of, of me and the Mira chair. They're very similar to the Shaker chairs, but they only have three legs. And when my brother was little, he kept falling off the three-legged chairs. So dad designed a four-legged chair, but this was the Mira chair. And I don't remember falling off of them. My brother didn't sit still. Next, please. And this is a long chair from 1951, which we still make. Um, there are a limited number of them on the secondary market and people get frustrated because there aren't enough. And so we have put them back into production. Next, please. Um, that straight back chair that I showed you previously was replaced by the new chair, which was designed in 1956. Um, we had so much breakage with the bending the backs on the straight back chair. So, so dad made this other chair that he called the new chair and the back is not bent so severely. So it has a much greater success rate of bending backs. The Konoi chair was designed in 1960. Um, and there was a furniture designer who said it couldn't possibly be done because it's only on two legs and you're gonna be sued up and down. And what did my father think he was doing? Well, he was an architect. He knew how to cantilever things, <laughs> including people. And we have less breakage with that chair than any of the other chairs. Next, please. Uh, when the Conoid Studio was built in 1960, he um, was acquiring more and more of this wild free edge lumber. I should backtrack a little bit. Uh, when we were in the old house on Aquatong Road, where there's a picture of me, uh, you know, hammering a nail into a, a board in my white dress, um, Dad was not able to afford to buy the good wood that had straight edges and, and straight grain. So he would go to lumber um, lumberyard and discover that there were cutoffs from the lumber industry that he could get for a reasonable price. And so he started using this this lumber with the weighty edges and the cracks and the holes. And he used the technique of, of bridging the cracks with butterflies, which he had learned in camp from Gentaro Hikogawa. And uh, that's where that, and also the techniques of using found objects, using material that you had available uh, that he learned in camp. And uh, he said in the beginning, people didn't understand what he was doing. But he said after they caught on, he said they would pay extra for the cracks and the holes and the butterflies and the so-called deep defects. So um, in the 1960s, he began milling his own lumber and he would get these you know, big trees and he would save the crotch ends, which a lot of people would just cut off and throw away. And uh, he designed benches and tables and other things using the crotch ends. And this was the conoid bench, which he named after the conoid studio, which was completed in 1960. Next, please. Oh, this is a picture from 1966. My mother and brother are in that photograph along with Mr. Mallinson, um, and that is in London. Um, Dad was just thrilled that he was able to go and select, back in those days, you could do this, <laughs> uh, select English walnut and English oak burl logs in whole. And then you could put them on a boat and ship them across to the USA, and then he could mill them the way he wanted to. And he was so proud that he got these beautiful logs from England that he said the queen didn't know what she was doing. She should have sold her crown jewels and kept those logs. 
he got them and he brought them home and they were very precious to him. And we, we still have a little bit of that lumber left. Not too much, but <laughs> he, he really thought that was special. Next, please. This is the only photograph that I remember having <laughs> uh, of acquiring of an English oak burl log standing in England. Can we go to the next one? And the same log on the sawmill. Um, and this, this was probably the most beautiful English oak burl log we've ever had. So um, it's, it's always a surprise. You never know quite what's going to be inside, but this one was burled all the way through. And it was a beautiful log, and that's why Dad was so happy to get that. Next, please. This is where we store our lumber. Uh, when my father died in 1990, there was a huge pile of lumber which was air drying in Philadelphia and uh, we had nowhere to put it. So we uh, convinced the zoning people, we're actually uh, grandfathered into a, a residential area in New Hope. Uh, we convinced the zoning people that this would be a temporary structure and would only be necessary until we used up that pile of wood. Um, I don't know when we're going to use up that pile of wood, but it's been, the building has been there since 1990 and the wood pile hasn't disappeared yet. So I guess it'll be there a while. <laughs> and uh, there's a small pile of burls in the upper right hand corner. And in the lower right hand corner, there are some of the tools of the trade. We, we still use pencil and paper for our drawings. Uh, the uh, Steel tape is an indispensable tool for our work, and so are the, the saws. Next, please. This is um, a view of the inside of our shop. I guess it must be shortly after the workday was over because there's still a lot of dust in the air. But it's a it's a wonderful place. Uh, we recently got some new machines. Our old machines were dated from 1957, and they were still working most of the time. So we just replaced them recently. It's, uh, we haven't expanded the shop. It's still that, that, that special place where everything happens. So um, let's see, I guess I got through most of this. Oh, I didn't, I sort of skipped. Uh, when we were um, at the little cottage on Aquatong Road, my father used to walk, you know, he was used to hiking from his early days. And he found this slope, which is a south facing slope, and he didn't have enough money to pay for it, but he convinced the owner who was a farmer and he'd also gone to MIT uh, that maybe he could pitch his tent on three acres of property and build his shop um, in exchange for labor on the farm. So that's how we got to where we are now. He eventually worked off his, his uh, payment for the first three acres and built a house. He built the shop first. This was the first building on the property. And uh, he's built about 15 buildings altogether since then, kept running out of space to store the lumber, I think. Next, please. So the person on the left is my husband, John Yarnell, who's been here for almost 50 years, shaving spindles for the chairs. We do get the chair parts. Um, well, we do them in batches. Part of them we do in batches here and some of the spindles and turnings and the seat blanks uh, we have made elsewhere. But, uh, so the chair department is mostly assembly and uh, we still shave our spindles by hand. It's a test of woodworkers to see if they have peace of mind and skill of hand so they can shape uh, and shave the, uh, the hickory spindles properly. Next, please. And this is just, these are some of the shots of our workmen um, and the work people, work persons <laughs> from the past. The person on the left is Jerry Everett. Um, he took woodworking with a friend of my father's just at the local high school and came to work when he was 15. He worked with us for 50 years and decided it was time to retire, but he was, he was our, our wood sourcer, you know, if we have a job coming in, uh, we had to find the right piece of wood to do that shop, job. And uh, there he is in a pensive moment, wondering which piece of wood would work best for some project or other. 
The picture on the right is one of my former design assistants. Actually, she was my first design assistant, Miriam Carpenter. And uh, she's out in the, in the uh, woodshed uh, drawing pictures of, of some wood. And she was, you have to be quiet to be able to do what we do. You have to have peace of mind. You, you know, it can't be, we've had people before who would just, you know, just, or don't have the right mind. And uh, we are very fortunate that we have a group of woodworkers and designers and makers who love their work and work quietly. There's, uh, when I was writing my book, which is now out of print, called Nature, Form, and Spirit, I couldn't figure out how to put all my notes together until I read a copy of The Unknown Craftsman, which was written by Soetsu Yanagi and translated by Bernard Leach. It's a really good book. Maybe some of you have read it already. If you haven't, um, it's an insight into the Zen mind of craftsmanship in Japan, which is called the Menge movement. Still very relevant to me today. I don't know if our workers have read it, but they embody it. They understand it and they live it. Next, please. This is Alyssa, one of our few lady woodworkers. Um, and it's the process we go through. I mean, Miriam was out there drawing a, a design, and then uh, we take the designs into the shop and um, figure out how to make them. And uh, Alyssa's there going over her notes. She takes copious notes on what's been done before, so she has a reference. And I'm looking over her shoulder, wondering which piece of wood to use for the project. So that's the way it goes. And there's a camaraderie and a respect between us all, which is wonderful. Next, please. And here's Alyssa working on that same piece of wood. Um, she does use, you know, we all use um, electric tools to make life easier. And uh, just a little bit in order to clean out some bark. And uh, Mike Feith is there on the right with a very complicated piece of carpentry was taken from one of my father's designs from the 1970s, I think. Um, but he has a knack and some of them have it when they come and some of them develop it as they go along. Of, um, when you fit two pieces of wood together, like in a cabinet or at right angles, they have to fit so perfectly. Um, you can tell when it's fit properly because there's a certain sound that a joint will make when it's fitted properly. And, and there is Mike He's just standing there. I think he's you know, sanding the edges between the joints, but uh, his, his work is just extraordinary. And he's, he's so quiet, um, he doesn't talk much. And that's what so that's not Yanagi says, it's, it's a mark of a true craftsman. Next, please. And there are some of our spindles on the heat. We heat up those spindles before we put them into the chairs. So they shrink and the joints are tight. And uh, I don't know who discovered that when, but we've been doing it as long as I can remember. And it still works. And uh, there's a view uh, through one of the windows from the workshop of the outside. We are not in just one big building as a factory building, but there a series of smaller buildings and there's landscaping in between. So it's, 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 a, it's a pleasure to walk between buildings and uh, enjoy the landscape as we go. Um, the view on the right is of Justin Taylor. He's been our finisher for, gosh, I don't know how many, 20 some years, I guess. But this finishing process is, can be really boring and tedious. But uh, Justin has been doing it for so long, it's kind of like a meditation for him. And as we, we coat, uh, we use a tongue oil varnish, a pure tongue oil, which he discovered, uh, polymerized tongue oil. And uh, we apply it for sometimes five or six coats on a tabletop like this. But it's not that easy. You put the oil on and you have to let it dry a certain period of time and then wipe it off thoroughly and uh, let it dry thoroughly and then sand it down and then repeat the process over and over and over again until you get a nice smooth surface. 
and uh, he is really good at it. I mean, as I say, it's like a meditation for him, and the product is the same. <laughs> Next, please. And these are just a view of some of our buildings. Um, these are old photographs, but. The dogwood is still blooming. The azalea is just about ready to bloom this time of year. And uh, the picture on the right is a pathway um, to from the showroom to the house. The house is where dad and mother and Kevin and I all lived. Uh, nobody lives there now since my brother passed away three years ago. But uh, dad liked the fact that he had an integrated process, that he lived where he worked and he worked where he lived. <laughs> And that uh, the spaces in between were, were, were all designed and built by him, and they're very beautiful also. The building on the left is the showroom, which has been the office building ever since my mother um, needed a space to work separate from the house. And my brother was born in 1954. Um, it has a corrugated transite roof, <laughs> which is still in really good shape. and. Uh, just one of the buildings where we work. Next, please. This is the interior of the Conoid studio where our design team works. Today, the 5th of May, happens to be Boys Festival Day in Japan. And for every boy in the household, they will fly one of those carp, not usually such a big carp. They're really hard to come by these days, but usually smaller carp. Nowadays, they're made out of plastic or paper. This one is actually made out of fabric. And my father had hung it in that studio. I mean, we've replaced them uh, as they wear out or fade away. Um, but we've always had a very large carp hanging in the Conoid studio since it was finished in 1959. And that's where we keep a lot of furniture. It's in the, in the back room is where we design our furniture. And in the basement, there's a lot of wood that we use for our project. Next, please. Well, this is a photo of a group of men that my dad worked with when he was in Japan. He came over in 1964 when I was in graduate school in Tokyo. And uh, he met with some Japanese uh, craftspeople in Shikoku, Japan, one of the southern islands. And he would be, you know, he fell in love with them and they, with him. And he became part of the, the Ningguren group, which is an offshoot of the Ningge movement. And uh, they, still making furniture. They're the only company in the world that's licensed to make Nakashima designs legally. And uh, they are very generous. Whenever we go over there, we may be doing a show with them in the fall, uh, but they've done uh, over a dozen shows for us and over the years. And we're very grateful for their craftsmanship and their, um, their uh, attitude. And you can see them all smiling. It's a, this is probably a photo from the 80s or 90s, but um, they have been wonderful to work with, and we're great, grateful to have them as associates and friends. Next, please. This is one of the cabinets that was developed um, through your association with the, with the Mingren group, and uh, the grill work is made in Japan, and they, they, uh, they will make it in Japan. They ship it over to us. And then we make the cabinets around it. But the very first one was designed and made for a show in Tokyo. So it's, it's called the Odakyu cabinet because that's the name of the department store where the show was held. Next, please. Well, these, are, these are two of the other Minguren uh, designs. They're both called Minguren One. The one on the left is Minguren End Table, and the one on the on the bottom is Mingren coffee table. And they're both made out of English oak girls. Next, please. Oh, this is, these are called the Green Rock Ottomans. My father had a significant uh, uh, commission to work on the governor, then Governor Rockefeller's home, Nelson Rockefeller's home in Pocantico Hills, which was designed by his best friend, Junzo Yoshimura, in the 1970s. And um, Rockefeller's asked Yoshimura if he would make the furniture. And Yoshimura said, well, why don't you have my friend George make the furniture? So that was one of the biggest projects we have ever done. He 
design these odd ottomans for them. Um, my parents went over to Japan and selected these nice Minge uh, batik uh, designs and offered them to the Rockefellers, but they said it didn't match their Chinese antiques. So we are very happy to have the Rockefeller rejects at our reception house. I think we've simplified it now with Velcro, but it used to have a very intricate under um, strapping system. You can see the little wedges and in the upper right hand corner that go through uh, slots that hold the straps in place. Next, please. This is a, a um, grouping of Nakashima furniture that was at the Metropolitan Museum in New York off the Japanese wing. <clears throat> um, they have since uh, moved it. So it no longer has a dedicated space, but everybody still enjoys it. And of course, everybody wants a table just like that, and there is no other table just like that. It happens to be bookmark English walnut. And there is a set of Konoi lounge chairs around it. Um, it is in the Japanese wing at the Met now, but it's not in the dedicated space that it was originally designed for. Next, please. This is another grouping which I'm very fond of. Um, my dad did his last great and first great retros retrospective show at the American Craft Museum in 1989. And uh, one of our clients had commissioned this redwood table. It's about eight feet round and it's a root section, which we don't usually do, but they said they would love to have that table. So we designed a table. I actually helped um, redesign it because it had to travel. It was a traveling show and it was too heavy and delicate to move by itself. So I made the base so it's removable. Dad never wanted bases to remove, but sometimes it's important. So um, this was, we traveled around the country and uh, came home uh, just before the owners of the table had a house fire and their entire collection of Nakashima burned to the ground, except for the piece that they loaned to us for the museum show. So we're very grateful um, that they it survived the fire. <laughs> Oh, and this is a grouping that I did for the James A. Michener Art Museum in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. They had set aside a little room, a little reading room, which was similar, I thought, to the, the reading room at the Metropolitan Museum. And uh, so they, I did a grouping for them. Um, this is a Clara Walnut Burl table that I used for the coffee table. And uh, my mother said, oh, you're not allowed to use that. Dad said uh, he wrote on it, not for sale. And I said, well, it's not for sale, it's for his commemorative room in Doylestown. So it's still there and it still gets a lot of use. And uh, it's a, I'm glad we used his favorite pearl for his room. Next please. These are just some of the designs that had, I developed after dad passed away. Um, this is for a client in Hong Kong who wanted a solid back and a tatami These are some tables that I was experimenting with curves. <laughs> um, I just met Joseph Walsh, who's a very kind person and does a lot of curves, but his are all laminated and bent. Ours are cut out of solid wood. Uh, the one on the left I called a Simon table because it was designed for a client named Simon. The one on the right uh, was made from a piece of wood that was harvested from the Eschrick Museum. So it's uh, basically table. Next, please. And uh, I did a whole show of redwood pieces for Christina Grajales, who's who was a very avid supporter and of me uh, after my father passed. And uh, she had an entire show of redwood. And so I designed this um, desk on the upper left hand corner with done before. And the table on the bottom was uh, made of a humongous ash tree that had to come down and tenafly. So I call that the tenafly table. Next, please. 
Oh, and this was a humongous, I think it was, we've made bigger tables since, but this was the biggest table that I had had to make. <laughs> it was about 16, 18 feet long and five feet wide. So, and it was commissioned by the Sunset Studios or Sunset Settings Studio in uh, Texas. So I call this the Sunset Table. And the Concordia chair was designed for chamber music players who are friends of mine. And they were playing on some really ugly chairs one time. And I said, would you like some Nakashima chairs next performance? And they said, oh, OK. So I loaned them Nakashima chairs the next performance. And they said, they don't work for us. They're slanted back. And they, they, the, the seats are scooped. And they're too comfortable. And we don't play that way. <laughs> they wanted a. A, a chair that they could move around on with a flat seat and that the back didn't get in the way of their bow. So I mean, that's the Concordia chair. And uh, we've been selling it as you know, for other people besides musicians. So uh, that works. And then there's a music stand. It was first designed by my father in, in 1976. And then we keep making them and people pick out their own tops and they're all different. So this is just one of many. Not too many. We don't make too many of them. They're kind of, you know, musicians like to have uh, music stands that are a little more portable than this. This is not very portable, but it's fun to play in. Next, please. Oh, and this is, we, we had purchased, and I don't remember exactly why, but there was a big root end that some enterprising person had dug out of the ground in, in Oregon. And they had sliced it up in the slabs and, and we bought it. And then we got it in the lumber shed. And I thought, what in the world are we going to do with this? It's, it's kind of like got too many holes to make a table with. But they were really beautiful forms. And uh, I had a show at the Modern Gallery um, how many years ago now. But um, there was uh, an opportunity for a, a sofa. Uh, I think Bob A. Bell, the proprietor, said, well, why don't you make some upholstered pieces and George never did that so I made an upholstered piece and then there was an opportunity to display it so it could be seen from the outside window so I the, the crazy group part of it was visible from the window and then if you came into the inside you would have a sofa to sit on suitata sofa suitata means standing piece in in Japanese next please <clears throat> this is a, a group, I think it was from a while ago, <clears throat> of um, the men in the shop at the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and they, they come and go. My brother Kevin was still alive and he's sitting, he's standing on the top uh, level. And Jerry Everett, who retired a few years ago, is there on the bottom level, both of them in red shirts. And some of them are still with us, and some of them have moved on. So this is a picture of in front of the arts building, which was completed as a gallery for Ben Sean in 1967. For a gallery space and entertaining people sometimes. Next, please. Got an HP shell at roof, which is pretty exciting. Um, and this is a picture of my father thinking about his first peace altar. This was inspired by a humongous tree that my father acquired um, in 1984, and it was probably very expensive. And the, the lumberman, you know, told him this story about how hard it was to harvest this tree, how he's got to have it because he'll never see such a beautiful walnut tree again in his life. And so dad had a dream he would make peace altars for the world out of this one log. And this is the first one. Next, please. This is the second one, which uh, we built after Dad passed away. But he had been trying to negotiate sending one to Moscow. And uh, so we continued negotiating with Moscow and uh, just decided that if we dedicated it at the anniversary of the United Nations and then sent it to the Hague World, uh, the Appeal for Peace in 2001, that it would be part way to Moscow and maybe they would accept it and find a place to put it by then. So this was its dedication at the 50th anniversary of the UN. 
in New York. And as you can see, the ideal was to have people of all faiths, all nations, and, and all races meet peace, peacefully around a table somewhere on each continent of the world. Next, please. And this is the last one we did for uh, India. For, it's now in Oroville, the city of peace. Sorry, that photograph is not too good, but our family is there. <coughs> we went to visit it in uh, 2014. And that is, um, it's made at a lower height, so people could gather around it and they're sitting on the floor. And um, so um, this is what happens when you get inspired by trees. Um, architecture never left dad, even though he left architecture. So he built a lot of different buildings, uh, among which are five thin warped shelves shells and one is in reinforced concrete where I'm sitting now. You can see the, 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 the waves in the roof, which the engineer added in order to make it a, a true shell. And uh, we're just very grateful to have a crew of craftsmen devoted to working with their hands, some of whom have training in art or design, designers who've had experience in making things of wood, and a talented crew in the office to take care of management, which is always difficult. They're very good at it. Uh, maintenance, groundskeeping, archiving, visitors, and tours. Fortunately, because of the nature of our work, it's a refreshing and peaceful environment. And I can't wait to come to work every day. Um, I, uh, my father wrote his book, Soul of a Tree, which I quoted from in the beginning, explaining his using trees as partners in the craftsmanship and design, which continues to inspire several generations of woodworkers. We hope to continue this work as long as we can. So there's still a huge stockpile of wood waiting to be made into something useful. But much of it is from my father's time. So far, there are men and women devoted to creating useful and beautiful objects with their hands, which is our way to peace. We hope that the environment my father created, as well as the small objects, we call them small objects, of furniture we make will continue to bring peace to our world as much as it has to us. So that's that. I hope our timing is OK. And I think we're going to open it up to, to questions and answers now. Yes. Thank you so much, Mira. Fantastic presentation. Um, yes, we invite you all to ask questions in the Q&A or the chat. We have a couple coming in. Um, I thought that quote about at first they didn't understand is just so meaningful since mm -hmm. that people understand now even more than ever about the importance of this aesthetic and and your work and your father's work but and so Yanagi speaks about the perfection of imperfection as well as that that uh, no mind uh, attitude towards your work um, I've, I've uh, you probably are very well aware of Toshiko Takeizu, but she also felt that way about her material, her clay, that it would often speak to her and tell her what it wanted to be, and she'd just go with it. Amazing. Well, and just that you, what you've contributed to the longevity of, of your company is phenomenal as well over, over time. I mean, this is a quarter, quarter of a century uh, plus that you've, you've extended this this whole voice of the company i would love to know how do you feel that there's been a shift um in your vision for nakashima woodworkers over over the last even even the years since um the landscape episode you know 16 years ago when that when that came out have, have you shifted your vision would you say oh not really oh i mean um i i keep learning more and I think that's important too. I mean, dad used to say, if you stop learning, you're, you're dead. You know, you got, you got to keep learning. <laughs> but um, yes, my concern is um, who's going to carry it on after my generation. Uh, my oldest son, who was in the picture of the workman in the, uh, by the art building, um, had a car accident. He was the only one of my children who was really interested in woodworking, but he's quadriplegic and can't work. Um, and uh, we're not sure exactly how the future is going to look. Uh, 
um, some of our advisors said we should uh, be a nonprofit, and um, I'm just a little. We do have a nonprofit, and it creates a lot of work, which isn't real work with your hands. It's it's work, you know, taking people around and doing programs and 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 uh, uh, you know entertaining people. <laughs> My brother used to love it. We used to have open house, and he would. He would be so happy he'd sit down in the studio all afternoon and talk to people, but he can't work and talk to people at the same time. <laughs> so we need to reach a compromise. Um, I've recently come up with something that's called um, a purpose trust, which sounds like it would work for us. Um, the, tr the purpose of the trust would be woodworking, of course, and that would be the guiding principle of the future. I, I don't want to you know, have this nonprofit take over all of our energies and be beholden to a board of directors and uh, you know at the expense of our woodworkers. Because the woodworkers are our heart and soul. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I'm going to start uh, covering some of the questions that are coming in. Um, Grace Toy is in on the Jersey Shore and asks if. Um, you have thoughts about your father's work in Roosevelt, New Jersey? Oh, that, that's the home of Ben Sean. Uh, ben Sean was one of my dad's dearest friends, and he furnished his, well, he, he built a second floor um, on Ben Sean's house in Roosevelt, New Jersey, and, um, and furnished it. Uh, I don't know what condition it's in now. They, they sold it to a... Um, uh, collector of Nakashima's and then they moved to Tokyo. So I don't know what's happening to that poor house. Okay. If we receive comments, I'll let you know. Um, let's see. Um, Albert, Albert Lakoff, uh, are all the peace tables made from the original large log? So far, they are made from that original large log. The next ones we make, we're going to have to we might have to get into another log here. There still are several planks left, but I'm, they're probably not quite as big as the first set and the second set. Um, and also that image that you showed in uh, Japan, um, in, I can't remember the date, we could always go back, but uh, was, was everyone, was he sitting on um, his bench? Yes, he was, yeah, <laughs> yes, he was. Great. Um, Lisa Reyes asks if you choose wood by its scent. Huh. No, you can sometimes um, smell if you're, if you, sometimes we're not quite sure what species of wood we're, we're dealing with. And sometimes you can tell by the smell whether it's a uh, Persian or English or American walnut. <laughs> um, I, some, of us, some of us have been so exposed to so much dust that you can't really tell. <laughs> Our smellers don't work that well anymore. There's a lot of very kind comments coming in as well, which we will share with you after after the event. Um, wondering, yeah, as far as training, um, how you handle that with, with people who join? Oh, well, it's a, it's a, uh, when dad and mother were in charge, they, they like to get people like Jerry who had recently graduated from the local high school and had taken woodworking there and were, had shown a talent for woodworking. Um, and then we would train them here. Um, and so that went on for a while. And um, then they're in the, let's see, when was it? There was a period of time, I guess it must have been post-war in, in the late 50s. Um, there were a number of European in, immigrants who needed jobs. And they had been trained um, in Europe. So we had several Italians and several Germans who worked with us who had had a, an amazing skill set. And uh, dad worked with them and it was, it became more of a collaboration when, when those skilled craftsmen were working with us. Um, and it, you know, we, as I said, we're always learning. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're, you know, we're not going completely over to CNC anytime soon. Uh, we don't have any CNC machines and uh, we still do things. We still do our drawings by hand. <laughs> we still do things the hard way. Yeah, any changes in terms of tools or 
well, we got three new machines in the in the workshop, but they're they're kind of the same as the old machines, only better. Okay. Yeah. And, and we do have computers in the office. Dad didn't believe in computers, but we couldn't live without them now. Right. Sure. 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 And what about um, how do you feel? You is there a way to describe, define your different take on on the design approach from your father's? That's a good question. Um, Bob A. Bell, my uh, colleague, has been puzzling over that for a while. He said he was going to try to write a book and he hasn't gotten very far with it yet. Um, I remember when dad first died, there was a, 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 a gallerist um, in uh, Virginia who had a gallery that was called The Full Circle in Alexandria. And uh, she had a show for me right after dad. Well, I think they had a show of dad's work, sort of a, a Perspective. And then they had a show for me and she said, it's, I mean, she was saying, and I don't know if she said it to the press or anybody else, but she said, and I overheard it, she said, it's a seamless web between the two. I'd worked for 20 years under dad. So, you know, I was learning all this stuff that he did and why he did it. And, and I learned a lot from the men and, and you know, the people in the shop. Um, so, you know, my first show at Bobby Bell's gallery in the Modern was called Continuation, because that's what I thought I was doing. Mm -hmm. So, um, I try my best to continue as dad would have liked us to do. We do a lot more detailed drawings than we used to. When I first came in the 70s, dad would um, do like this, this freehand sketch on a five by seven piece of paper and pass it to the men and say, here, you make it. I said, don't they need a little more instruction than that? And he'd give them a piece of wood and tell them to go to it. Uh, but he was in the shop himself every single day and they'd work on it to a certain point. And they said, okay, you know, they'd sit there until they came back and said, okay, now what do we do? And I said, well, maybe we should put more details on the drawing. So I started putting more details on the drawing. Um, I did go to architectural school in Japan where everything is extremely carefully detailed. So I brought that with me and uh, it's, you know, you don't want to get through too much detail because it always looks different on the bench than it does on a piece of paper anyway. So, but we, we give them as much direction as possible. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I don't want to occupy too much of your time, but last, I just wanted to ask any, um, any thoughts in terms of, you know, the work and body's response to the environment, um, it's so intertwined, and I wonder with climate crisis if how that's shifted how you approach the design, the business, all of it. Yeah, um, we are undergoing a, um, a, I guess, a revolution or you know renovation or or whatever to try to. Um, decrease our carbon footprint uh, to zero, but it's going to take a number of years to get there. Uh, we thought at one point we would put solar panels on our uh, woodshed, but it turns out there's too many trees shading it, so it's not a terribly efficient way of, of generating um, power with, with, you know, without fossil fuels. Um, we are thinking of going to geothermal energy, um, and uh, that is going to be a process that we <laughs> are doing research for, uh, we need to have a, a, an overall landscape um, plan. <laughs> we never had an overall landscape plan. We need to plot out where all the, uh, the underground power lines and, and, and uh, sewer lines and everything are before we start digging around uh, installing geothermal. So it's gonna take a while, but we hope that we will eventually go towards a, a zero carbon footprint. Um, the other thing we've been doing because they're of the, the ash tree blight and the ash, no, it's the ash tree beetles. We've been using a lot of ash in our, <laughs> in our wood. We used to use uh, oak for the interiors of the cabinets. Now we use ash. Mm. Plentiful, it's not as inexpensive as it was in the beginning, but it's beautiful. Some of it is, I mean, I showed you that one picture of uh, this ash tree. The tenafly table was made from ash and it was figured and it was, really interesting and beautiful. So we, use, we, we use what's available <laughs> and what's fallen down and nobody wants anymore. Yeah, yeah, which has even more resonance 
in this day and age than probably when your father was originally picturing all of this where we yeah, would be now. The beginning it was just an economic necessity, but now it's a, it's a philosophical necessity. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. We're a couple of minutes over. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of Craft in America in every way, shape, and form for what you have, have done as a model for crafts people across the entire country world, really. And um, thank you so much for today. And um, Landscape can be watched on our website and YouTube channel. And um, you're incredible and we admire you so much and thank you for this presentation, Mira. It's been oh, you're welcome. It was my pleasure. It's nice to meet you, and I hope I get to meet some of the other people listening in. And uh, I just want to extend my warmest thanks to Carol for bringing us together. <laughs> okay. Thank All you. Right. Take care. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Oh, maybe I need to talk about uh, visiting hours since COVID and we weren't allowed to have visitors. Um, I was very happy to have a five day week instead of a six day week. So now we were only allowing visitors in on uh, uh, guided tours, which are sold out for the year already. And um, we do have um, a, a, an experimental open house of self guided tour but um, we are experimenting with that tomorrow. So we'll see how that goes. If it's successful, we could open up some more spaces, but otherwise um, it's by appointment only. If you wanna order furniture, we do allow people in <laughs> to look at their wood. Now, when we, when we couldn't do that during COVID, we did everything by email and photograph. Uh, now we are allowed to have visitors. So if you really want a piece of furniture, we will let you in. Otherwise um, you have to take your chances self-guided tour. Okay, great. Yeah, we shared, we shared a link uh, early on. Um, yes, and feel free to send us questions on that front too, and we'll direct them to, to Mira if anyone um, needs more information. Okay, thank you again. Oh, thank you, everybody. <laughs> Hope to see you again in person. <laughs>